just imagine you're an American GI and you've arrived here in Britain in this small old village in Wiltshire, Oldbourne. You may have never left your state in America and suddenly you're in a completely new environment and you're training for one of the biggest invasions in military history. Shortly after their country's entrance into the Second World War, hundreds of thousands of US servicemen found themselves stationed in the UK, preparing to assist with the war effort in Europe. Among those based in the village of Aldbourne, Wiltshire, were members of the 101st US Airborne Division, and in particular, Easy Company of the 506th Parachute Infantry Regiment. Famous, of course, for being the subject of Stephen Ambrose's book Band of Brothers and the subsequent hit miniseries. And they were here from 1943 up until the 5th of June 1944. And they would have trained here, they would have drank at this pub here, the Blue Boar, they would have socialised here, they would have mingled with the local population. But you can just imagine what it must have been like for them. A village they described as looking like a Hollywood film set, Easy Company spent just under nine months in the idyllic West Country village, and they certainly left their traces behind. In this series, we're going to explore these traces. You really can't get more American than an M1 Garand clip. Following a team of archaeologists hoping to unearth the remains left behind by the real Band of Brothers. This is, you know, gold dust. You're not going to get these things. Gold. It's the rare as, rare as hen's teeth, this. Hello and welcome back to the History Hit YouTube channel. I'm here in Aldbourne, Wiltshire, the village famous for hosting Easy Company of the 101st Airborne Division. Now, we've all either seen or heard of the TV show Band of Brothers, but today Richard Osgood and a team of volunteers are hoping to find some real remnants of the company stationed here 80 years ago. One of the best known Allied units involved in the D-Day landings Easy Company was established as part of an experimental airborne regiment in 1942 at Camp Tekoa in Georgia. After months of harsh physical training, the company was relocated across the Atlantic to Great Britain, where it would undergo further preparation before the Allied invasion of Normandy in June 1944. The village of Aldbourne in Wiltshire was an ideal location for members of the 101st Airborne due to its proximity to Salisbury Plain airfields and training areas. Using state-of-the-art LiDAR technology, Richard and his team believe that what is now a football field used to be the site of several Nissan huts, where members of Easy Company would have slept, socialised and hopefully left traces of their time there behind. Just as the team began to pick up their trowels, I caught up with Richard to find out more about the project and what he was hoping to find. Hi Richard, good to see you. Uh, now, tell me a bit about what's happening here and how this all came about. Well, what we're looking at behind us is the excavation of what we think is going to be a hut used by the, uh, the Americans here in the Second World War. Not any old Americans though, because this was 101st Airborne, 506th Parachute Infantry Regiment, and Easy Company, and everyone knows them because it's probably the most famous military unit in the war. In the war, it's uh, Band of Brothers. Yeah. Uh, our aspiration here is to find the hut used by these guys in late 1943, up to their, their, their jump on D-Day. They did come back slightly later on, but it's those kind of formative months of Easy Company when they lived in this field in Wiltshire. That's what we're looking for. And these sort of huts would have been used just, uh, they would have socialised and obviously slept in these, yep. in these uh, Nesson huts? Yeah, I mean, you can imagine in, in late 43 and into 1944, they're doing their training all around here. We're not far from Salisbury Plain, so yeah. they do some practising here. Chilton Folia is the jump school that's very close. In the woodlands around here, we, we think there are little positions that they trained in, and that became really vital for what they were going to experience in Europe later on. 
Um, but this is where they bond, this is where they become a unit because they sit around, they have the downtime around the stove, they, they have a go at the officers as all military guys will do. Yeah, um, they plot, course. they plot against the officers here and you know it's a famous, famous element with the sergeants thinking about Sobel. Sobel. That happens in this field and that's incredible, you're relating directly to history. So this is where Easy Company becomes that unit that we all revere I think, it's in these small huts Little Quonset huts there, that like the Anderson shelters, that sort of style of thing, Nesson huts, um, in this field in Wiltshire for six months. It's the longest time they stayed at any point in the war was in this field. And have you dug here before and have you found any uh, remnants of uh, Easy Company already? Yeah, I mean, we're, we're, we're fairly confident we're going to find something because in 2019, gosh, the time flies, uh, we did excavate one of the huts which we think was used by the sergeants, so people like um, Don Malarkey or Carwood Lipton, some really Lipton, big names. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and we found within that, uh, we weren't expecting to find anything because it's been levelled to make this sports pitch. We found the hut, we found things like Pepsi bottles, we found a bit of parachute, parachute pull, uh, nylon stocking, bottles, glasses, uh, all sorts of things, American military rounds, all sorts of things connected with Easy Company and that was a really lovely thing. I'm an archaeologist yep. so I love connecting with the people through the finds and what's left in the ground and that's, you know, it's a really incredible thing. Everyone knows about Easy Company but to see where they lived and found what they left behind Real is, oh, it's an amazing yep. feeling and hopefully we'll have that over the next week here. And of course you talk about working together as a unit but as a local population here, how, how often do they interact with the local population here in Oldbourne? It, it, it's, um, a really important part of their story. Uh, anyone who's read any of the books will know about um, the laundry being done um, by local women. Um, there is the, the story of the Hearts and Minds campaign, which the Americans are very good at. I wonder whether the, the, uh, the nylon stocking we found was related to that somehow. <laughs> um, they, they use the dance floor, the, the, the local hall, the village hall, the dance yeah. floor is worn out by the Americans because they make such good use of it and they pay for a new one to be laid after the war. Oh, that's so there are all these things that there are GI babies that happen yeah. nine months after the and Americans. Marriages. Are here. And, yeah. Marriages. The, uh, you know, Spears, one of the most famous uh, guys of the unit, has a, a, as, a, as a child marries, marries a local girl. So there are all these stories. The interactions between local communities is key and uh, I think just them experiencing Wiltshire uh, must have been phenomenal. Some of these people probably had not left their um, left their state until they started in the military and then to come into this bucolic landscape and um, you know some of them refer to waking up as though they're on a Hollywood film set because it's such a beautiful location. There are stories of Dick Winters walking around Butts Lane with lardy cakes. You couldn't get more Wiltshire than exactly. having a, a lardy yeah. cake walking there and it's those stories. They still do the lardy cakes and um, I love the fact that the locals still remember Easy Company. It's still a big part of the story of a, a load of young men that came over here for a formative part in, in our own island story, and, and it happens here. Immortalised by Stephen Ambrose's book and the TV series, the story of the real Band of Brothers is nothing short of inspirational. Sustaining one of the heaviest casualty rates of the Second World War, Easy Company took part in several major liberation campaigns in Europe, from the Normandy Campaign to the Battle of the Bulge, Operation Market Garden to drinking champagne in Hitler's eagle's nest. Eager to see some remnants of the legendary military unit, I headed straight to the Heritage Centre in Aldbourne, where curator Cassie Rust was going to show me some of the finds the archaeological team dug up back in 2019. So Cassie, uh, these objects here are from uh, the dig that you did three years, 2019. Okay, so talk me through some of the some of the objects here. We have quite a wide variety. Okay, so the biggest and most obvious, this is parachute silk that was found. Wow, <laughs> original parachute silk. Yeah, it's incredible. A bit grubbier than it would have been in the day, but it's been yeah. under the soil for however many years. So related to the parachute silk, we've got a reserve parachute handle that would have been on the front of the parachute. The reserve chute was on the front. Mm -hmm. It would have been painted red. There are just traces of red paint left on it. So, you know, when you're in a panic, you can see the big red handle pull that. Just pull it. <laughs> Here we've got, it's the old style multi-sided thrupney bit. So, board squaddies, what do you do? How do you shoot a hole in a coin? <laughs> you don't hold your hand out and get someone to aim at it. No. You get your rifle mounted like that put it on the end, pull the trigger. And we have the round, so type of round go? that no will, way. will fit through it. And you can tell that it's been done very close because there's no flare, yeah. not much flare out. You've it's got a bit of a flare. It's too good of a, a shot. So that, that's sort of cool. Yep. And then over here, this seems quite, uh, so what's this here? You can that, see some that's sort a boot, 
Kiwi boot polish lid. <laughs> you can still see some of the, yeah. yeah, you can see boot polish. Yeah. Incredible. And then we've got, you see, recognize yeah. that? Yeah. Part of a guitar. Uh, part of, we see quite a lot of instruments. Here yeah. you have a guitar, so they, they might have been a band, a literal band of brothers. <laughs> And here, this looks like a, is this an uh, item of clothing or? Yes, yes, that's hearts and minds, that's a stocking top. A stocking top, really? So, there's tales told of some of the women who came to visit the village. Ah, okay. Got it, <laughs> got it. <laughs> Say no more. Say no more. And then moving along, uh, down here, is that a, so that's a US Army bayonet yep. found around here, locally? Yeah, Fa found on one of the farm areas. They, the Americans used a lot of the surrounding area for exercises. And yes, they managed to drop a bayonet. Um, there are tales told of them just cutting barbed wire and just going straight through. I can imagine you probably would have been told off for that. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And you had, so you had the trenching that. tools, that famous, uh, the first scene, think of Saving Private Ryan with uh, Captain bottles. Miller. Yeah. yeah, the water bottle there. Yeah. That's amazing. And you have some rings. Yeah. Uh, and down here, what's, what's that? The, That's an ammunition the, box. M1A1 for a tank. Yeah. Incredible. Some amazing so, finds here. The variety of artefacts discovered a few years ago gave me great confidence that Richard and his team would have no trouble unearthing a plethora of objects this year. Unsurprisingly, within half an hour of our arrival in the village, we were already alerted to a discovery. David, we're not even one hour in yet and you've already found something pretty cool. Well, we're currently in the area that we know Dog and Fox Company were billeted um, back in 43. Um, this is find number five of, of uh, Sector 7 that I'm covering at the moment. Um, the first find that came up the film was a modern penny. Um, I remember standing pretty much where the find came up talking to Richard earlier about, you know, hopefully what we were going to find. Um, six inches down, we've got an M1 Garand rifle clip. Wow. Doesn't seem a lot, doesn't look like much but you really can't get more American than an M1 Garand clip. You know, these would have been around here in their hundreds, if not thousands. Um, used with the M1 rifle, it would have held eight rounds and would have loaded into the, into the rifle in that fashion. And with this particular system, the, the charging um, clip would have stayed in the rifle. Yeah. And as the, the user fired it, uh, when it got to the eighth round, once the eighth round was fired, this would then Burst out. ping out. It makes an iconic noise, doesn't it? Covering fire! If you've ever played COD, yep. or if you've ever seen <laughs> Saving Private Ryan, or indeed, you know, Band of Brothers, yep. that iconic sound will be something that will come up on the clip. Um, they did some research on this. Um, it's interesting to think that, um, you know, that was quite a noise. The inference being that the enemy would hear that, and would, that would then be their opportunity to come in on someone who'd back. got an empty weapon. Yeah. Um, the research they did suggested that it wasn't as noisy uh, as first anticipated. It would be to, to the fire and to those immediately around him, but to the enemy possibly, you know, 20 plus yards away, the chances of hearing it slim to nil, particularly when you've got the sounds of battle going on as well. So Dave, tell me about how you're finding these objects. You've got a, a metal detector there. Well, as with any metal detector, I mean, this particular model is a, a Mine Lab 600 series. My colleague's using the 800 series, but um, yeah. uh, you know, we do have some, uh, some differences in, in technology. Uh, ultimately, this is using what's known as a double D coil. Okay. Uh, and that's uh, wired up to a box of tricks. It's a lithium battery. Um, in essence, what it is doing is looking for metal within the soil. Um, this particular model, as, as with my colleagues and much of the modern kit that you get, has a, an ability to discriminate between ferrous and non-ferrous. Okay. Um, they won't tell you exactly what it is, but the combination of the sound and the numbers that come up on, on, the, on the dial here will indicate to you roughly what you might be getting, whether it be iron, steel, copper, um, silver, gold, for example. I can give you an example from the M1 clip that we picked up yeah, earlier. Yeah, please do, um, show me. Show obviously me this is a surface that. find, so, um, and I've taken the earphones off so you can hear the actual machine. Uh, this one's currently set on all metal mode, so you might get a, a combination of numbers and noises that'll tell you that you've found something. Got it, but okay, effectively what we know is that this is a piece of rusted mild steel. So you hear that noise and you suddenly get, get excited, right? You do, you do. <laughs> um, if you want to see the difference, I mean, that's a piece of mild steel. If you've got a, a pound coin or something on you, 
Yep. Um, I can show you the, the difference in, in the different sort of um, signals and tones that you get depending on the different types of metal. Okay, here you go. There's and we know that's, that's a bimetallic product and it's circular. Yep. So we should get a really sweet, crisp note out of that as a result. Again, surface find. Now I would know. Slightly different noise, yeah. It's all go. over the place. Yeah, the, essentially the cleaner the noise. Yeah. You know, the more chances are you'll have you'll have something like um, copper, brass, silver, um, or a bimetallic um, product like or, that. Or a copper. bullet, perhaps, or something like that. Yeah, quite possibly. And as I say, hopefully in the next couple of hours we'll hopefully find some of those for you as well. Next time on Digging Band of Brothers, as the foundations of the Nissan Hut are revealed. It's crazy, it def definitely gives you um, shivers. We travel in appropriate fashion to the Blue Ball Pub in Oldbourne, where Easy Company socialised and intermingled with the local residents, referring to a very unique guidebook. The first important thing to remember is that the British are like the Americans in many ways, but not in all ways. We also make a small trip to the hills around Oldbourne, previously training grounds, where members of the 101st US Airborne Division have, quite literally, left their mark. I'm just the guy to show you around England. Sure, I know all about it. Why shouldn't I? I've been here three weeks. Well, the first thing I think we ought to take a look at is... an English pub. Yeah, let's get away from these docks, because I know a little country pub is just the sort of a place you fellas will be seeing. Come on, come on. In 1943, the British and American War Office presented this training film to American servicemen arriving in the UK in their thousands prior to the Normandy landings. Starring the well-known American actor Burgess Meredith, A Welcome to Britain served as a light-hearted guide to British society and informed US soldiers how to act and behave during their stay. As the dig continued on the outskirts of Oldbourne, I wanted to find out more about how American GIs adapted to life in Britain. And so I was given a lift to the village in a similar fashion to that which US servicemen would have experienced back in 1943. And in my possession, a very useful companion. Before arriving in Britain, every single American GI was given one of these guides. It was called Instructions for American Servicemen in Britain in 1942. Now this was their guide to understanding how to interact, how to fit in in Britain, how to socialise with the local population. And boy, is it full of some interesting nuggets. An example of one of the key warnings in the book issued to American soldiers, as well as in the instructional film, was to avoid boasting and flaunting their relative affluence especially if they had been invited over for supper. GIs were also reminded that those in the UK had put up with hardship for years for the sake of the war effort. These are proud people and they don't like to tell you the things they're short of, like tablecloths, which are nearly impossible to replace, and their food, which is so severely rationed. The British population had endured rationing on items such as eggs, meat, milk, jam, tea and sugar for over three years before American servicemen had arrived on their shores, and so it was imperative they learn proper etiquette at the dining table. So here's a little lesson for you on how not to behave when invited out to supper in a British home. Don't grab a handful of tomatoes. They're rare luxuries. Go easy with the meat. They each only get 25 cents worth a week. You can eat it all in one gulp, but don't. But food and table manners made up only a small section of the guide given to GIs. 
it was equally important that they learn how best to socialise with the local population, understanding appropriate topics of conversation and subjects to avoid. One of my favourite segments uh, in this manual is subtitled No Time to Fight Old Wars. It reads, if you come from an Irish-American family, you may think of the English as persecutors of the Irish, or you may think of them as enemy redcoats who fought against us in the American Revolution and the War of 1812. But there is no time today to fight old wars again or bring up old grievances. Now was the time to unite. As it says here, we don't worry about which side our grandfathers fought on in the Civil War, because it doesn't mean anything now. There's a real sense of unity here. And what better place to experience that sense of unity than a good old English pub, an institution considered so important to British life that it had its very own dedicated section in the handbook. I'm sat outside the Blue Boar, one of the uh, famous pubs that Easy Company would have socialised in, and this is where they would have met their English counterparts. Right now, Lieutenant, nice and easy, we still got a shot. Oh. Oh. And that's where guides like this were so valuable and important. There's a section here on page 14 which says, In getting along, the first important thing to remember is that the British are like the Americans in many ways, but not always. You'll quickly discover differences that seem confusing and even wrong. Like driving on the left-hand side of the road, and having money based on an impossible accounting system, and drinking warm beer. But once you get used to things like that, you'll realise that they belong to England just as baseball and jazz and Coca-Cola belong to us. Cheers for that. Having explored the village and the Blue Boar pub, it was time to return to the dig site on day five, where progress was being made on the area Richard Osgood believed would contain the foundations of a Nissan hut shelter. Kieran, how are you? Good mate, what's up? Right, this has completely changed from when we were here uh, on Wednesday. Yeah. You've dug up a lot of earth, seems like a lot of, uh, a lot of hard work, but what have you found so far? Oh, we've found a, a couple of uh, some cartridges uh, we found some, uh, some of the, the glass that probably would have been part of the, the huts here. Managed to find uh, all the, the post pads along here with the um, tar paper. And so we've just basically so lined them all up, so digging them all the way back to there to get them all nice and neat. Um, so yeah, a couple of little good finds along the way. Uh, and then you've got these white markers over there. Mm. So these uh, represent areas where they found yeah, they, signals on the metal detector? Yeah, hits on the metal detector. So they just, uh, there's a fair few over there. So You have uh, a family link to this area as well? Yes, so uh, my grandma lived in Auburn um, in, a, in, it's called the Clearview House, just near the cathedral there, uh, because my granddad was in the RAF and he, so he was serving on an okay. airfield nearby. Yep. Um, I didn't actually know this until I got here and told my mum that I was in Auburn and she said, she mentioned that, yeah, she lived here. So the, the locals have done a bit of digging up yeah. about it. And uh, so, yeah, it's, there's a, that link there, which is just crazy because I had no idea before I came here. That's amazing, a massive coincidence. And he might, may have been in the, in the field where they were practicing their Could have been, yeah. Today. It's crazy. It def definitely gives you um, shivers that, to, th to think yeah. that they could have just been walking in the same areas uh, that I'm, I'm in right now. So, yeah, it's, it's a great link and it's just a, an extra part of this dig that makes it more special. A lovely personal connection to the site and a number of promising finds. But as I was soon to find out, courtesy of archaeologist Dan Miles, traces of the 101st Airborne Division and perhaps Easy Company could also be found in the forests around Oldbourne. So Dan, why have you taken me roughly a mile or so out of, out of the village of Oldbourne? What do we have here? What does this uh, landscape represent? This is basically their training landscape. Okay. So the soldiers are in their camp in Oldbourne and these as part of their daily routines, they'd come out and do different aspects of training. Yep. One of the aspects is going out on big, long mile, uh, long hikes. Other aspects is say in orienteering, uh, maybe camping out at night, uh, bivouacking. Yep. And that's what they sort of using the whole area. This was their whole training area, the whole landscape here. So they might have to, I mean, that, that'll 
coming to use, won't it? Orienteering, knowing how to sort of camp and use the landscape exactly. when they're in Normandy. Exactly, it's preparation. No! You want to kill him! Harry right! Harry look! And you have the physical evidence. Tell me a bit about that. We do, yeah. Um, you know, unlike the camps where there are actual physical structures and the buildings, the evidence we have here is very ephemeral. Okay. Other evidence we're finding is in the beech trees around here, like some of these trees here, uh, where the actual soldiers sign their names. Oh, really? And so and that's uh, the other bit of evidence, yeah. Can we have a look at some of those yeah, engravings? Yeah. We'll go up uh, over to the trees there and have a look. Brilliant. Okay. So this is a, an example of one of the tree carvings. Oh, wow. Here. You can see it here. So you've got a... Got yep. a C dot L. Yep. And then no dot here, S, S, C, and then USA underneath it. So some of the guys have been thinking about it, saying that we, you know, they think it might be Carwood, Lipton, South Carolina, USA. I think it could be Lipton, but... But the problem with all these tree carvings is it's very, very difficult to get a positive ID. You'd like to think it's it was, but it could literally be anyone exactly. with those initials. Yeah, But it's, it's, it's scarily close. Yeah. So Lipton was from South, South Carolina, Carolina, wasn't he? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, can you imagine? Yeah. Can you imagine if it was? That'd be great. <laughs> well, that's a great start. Brilliant. Let's, uh, let's see some other ones. We'll carry on up the hill. Yep. Excellent. Cool, okay. I can the, see some writing here. Yep. Quite hard to make out, but... It is, it is. This is a problem. I mean, these things are done a long time ago yeah. uh, and the trees grow and the things come out. But this is a, it's in a good example, this tree, of lots of different tree carvings on the tree. Yeah. On the same one. We can't read this, but this is probably US, but you can see this here is army. Yeah. With the Y coming down. I think down. you can pretty much make that out. That's US yeah. dot, dot army with the Y With the Y coming, coming down. down. Not sure what would be up there, no, any ideas? It would be a name. A name, okay. But unfortunately lost. I, you could look, that's an A, that's an N. And then if we come round as well. Yep. Now that, that's a name. That's lovely, yeah. Samarin, uh, J43, June, July 43. And we know that this is definitely American. The names yep. are American. Um, very, we don't find as much British tree carvings. It's yep. different. The Americans are so far away from home. Yeah. They sort of like wanted to sign their names in, and you know, of course, where there's they no were. reason it's, for, yeah, no, no it's not amazing. If you're a Wiltshire Regiment or something, you, you, there's no need to, but here is there, it's, it's, it's different for the Americans. And you can imagine the GI carving this out Absolutely. with his knife, maybe bored yeah. whilst he's, he's camping, camping overnight. overnight. Yeah, yep. Yeah. And then round here, you have another one, another one as well. Yeah, it's a really nice one. This is a, this is a great one. This is Tony G43. Tony Certainly not British, this one. Definitely not British, <laughs> very much, I think so. 43, yeah. wow. Proper, perhaps in the same, same company, yep. almost certainly, Absolutely. probably. Um, pretty sure the same time. Came wow. down and did it the same evening, you know. And have you tried to track any of these names and tried we to have, find out their, we have, their identity? Um, there is a, there's a Tony Garcia uh, in the 506. Uh, it was quite a famous yeah. uh, a guy. But he didn't come until later. And so he was after 43, came later in 44, ah. and it was such a shame. We thought we had uh, that tie and that connection. Someone, yep. The problem is it, it's so difficult trying to actually find individuals. There are some examples you can, but it's tricky. It's amazing, but you still yep. here have that evidence, that physical evidence. Physical evidence, Let's yeah. hope this tree stands. Absolutely. Um, but yep. that's amazing. The only thing we could do, I thought to the, the owner, um, you know, if this was to come down, we could maybe chop it and chop it. Yeah. and keep it as a sort of in the museum or yeah. something. I've seen that being done. Or other people's make um, uh, moulds. That would be great like to mold, do that. Which would be yeah. really nice. So, so when you see the dates, that just really does yeah. bring history home. Soldiers, sailors and airmen of the Allied Expeditionary Force, you are about to embark upon the Great Crusade toward which we have striven these many months. The eyes of the world are upon you. The hopes and prayers of liberty-loving people everywhere march with you. Next time on Digging Band of Brothers, a haul of remarkable finds are revealed by Richard. And then you see someone doing a little dance by the metal detectors and they shout dog tag. And Dan reveals some amazing news with relatives of an Easy Company veteran 
across the pond. This is something that, you know, he may have wore around his neck, he may, you know, he may have thrown away, he may have, he may have handled that. Oh, wow. That, that's incredible. It's day five at the dig site of Operation Nightingale in Aldbourne, and the team's search for traces of the real band of brothers was well underway. As the foundations of one of the Nissan hut shelters used by Easy Company were now clearly visible, vines were emerging left, right and centre. But not all historic items in sight had just been dug up. Members of the public had flocked to the site with a myriad of artefacts relating to the 101st Airborne Division, including one local military historian, Roger Day. Now, what do you have here, Roger? It looks like a, an American GI's helmet. That's exactly what it is, an absolute genuine World War II American uh, paratrooper's helmet. It belonged to an uh, um, American called Gilbert Morton. He was in the headquarters company, 506 Parachute Infantry Regiment, he was stationed about three miles from here, a place called Ramsbury, and uh, this, this was the tin hat he was wearing on D-Day. Now, uh, it came into my possession when I was about 13 years old, and uh, I had started to get interested in the military history of this area. Of I'm talking to my father, and he said, uh, I think there's an old tin hat in your aunt's garden. This was in Ramsbury, so we had to go down there immediately, obviously. Um, I remember it very clearly, it was, a, it was a Saturday morning, it was pouring of rain and this was in the garden, it was upside down like this, with some soil in the bottom of it and sort of rather a pathetic looking plant or weed growing out of it. I was a bit disappointed to say the least, I was expecting something far more pristine. Anyway, my aunt gave it to me, I put it in my father's shed, let it dry out and gradually removed the surface rust and Markings started to appear. There's yep. a marking on the side, another one on the back, and another one on this side. Now, at the time, remember, I was only 13 or 14, no idea what these represented. And it was only about five years later I decided to do some proper serious research. My, fortunately, my aunt was still alive, went back and saw her, and she said this the helmet belonged to a, a Gilbert Morton who was billeted with her during the war. Okay. Um, and uh, so she knew his name. Yep. Um, and from that, I was able to contact the 101st Airborne Division Association, who said, oh, he's still alive. I wrote to him. He sent back a letter explaining all about why the helmet was in my aunt's garden and why, intriguingly, it had this large dent in the side yes. of it. So you can see it's got a, a very significant dent. Now, do we know where that's come from? We do. Yep. Tell me. <laughs> Gilbert wrote back, and I specifically asked him about the dent. Yep. He's, this was the helmet he, he, he jumped with when he jumped into Normandy. They landed a short distance from a village called saint com de mont mm -hmm. um, which was some distance from their objective. So they had to make their way to, to the objective. They came to a crossroads. As they approached the crossroads, a German shouted halt. And I think Gilbert fired and turned and started to run off. And then another German fired and that bullet hit the helmet. And it said it gave him a... Bit of a headache. I can imagine. But, but it saved his life. But it, So it must have just glanced off the helmet. Yes. Because a, a real bullet, if it had gone directly... Oh, that would have been the end. That would have been the yeah. end. So he's just got very lucky there and he still kept it. And you, you can see the markings here. Yep. You can see there's still the spade. That's right. Well, again, I didn't know what these were. Yep. Um, but research showed that the 506 there, um, recognition flash was a spade. And there you can see a spade on, on both sides. Yep. Um, he was a sergeant, so he had an NCO's rank bar on the back. Yep. Uh, uh, officers wore vertical bars and uh, and also there's a little dot here this represents the the battalion he was in third battalion and you can still see some of the green but if you can see that just some of the original color is still there yep, isn't still it? there and of course he after he survived sorry, the war but he yep. went after d-day the uh, uh, they came back to regroup here in the uk and he was sent back to my aunt's house and was quartered there again for about another six weeks brought the helmet with him stuck it on a post in her garden, yep. and that's where it stayed until I came along one very wet Saturday morning about 1968. Wow, what an incredible story. Thank you for bringing this object to us, Roger. <laughs> Amazing. A truly unique find, and an equally remarkable story to accompany it. 
Yet as well as learning more about the individual accounts of D-Day from those who took part in the Battle for Normandy, I was equally intrigued by the production and filming of the hit TV series that had reunited so many people in Aldbourne. Luckily, two members of the cast of Band of Brothers were on hand to share their experiences. We're lucky enough to be joined uh, by one of the cast of the hit TV series, uh, Band of Brothers. Rick joins me. How are you, Rick? First yeah, of all. I'm good. I'm hot, but I'm good. Yeah. Uh, now, you were in, uh, correct me from eight episodes of the, uh, of the hit TV series. Yeah, I was in eight episodes of Band of Brothers. I played Lieutenant Harry Welsh, and Harry was from Wilkesbury, Pennsylvania. And he was actually with 82nd Airborne initially, and then joined 101st. Um, and um, he was Dick Winter's, well, one of his closest friends, really, and went through the ranks with him and survived the war, fortunately, and was stationed with him just at the cafe in town. You can see the window where Winters um, stayed and you can see where Harry stayed in the window next door. And there was a PT field here, a training field where they did all of their calisthenics and stuff. I'm sure Harry did push-ups a lot more than I could have done <laughs> uh, just over there. Um, it's, I'm not necessarily a big person for believing in ghosts or anything like that, but I certainly can feel easy company around here. And what was the uh, process of filming like um, for across those eight episodes that you were Well, we didn't come of. to Aldbourne to film. We, I think I'm right in saying, I, although I joined in the first episode, typically we um, made our own Aldbourne. You know, we didn't film in the Vastone, we made our Vastone. Um, and similarly, Aldbourne, I think the exteriors were shot in a, a village called Hambledon out in Buckinghamshire. We did a boot camp that lasted 11 days um, at Longmoor Training Camp down mm -hmm. the M3. And I had, um, we all had a tough time. Uh, I, I, I had a time I'm still processing. Actually, Tim Matthews is, is, is the same who's here with me today. For a bit of context, the guy who headed it up, and maybe Rick mentioned this, a guy called Dale Dye, <clears throat> he began these intensive boot camps for military series and films, I think, years before that. The idea was that when they began to portray something, when the director said, you're exhausted, or the director said, you're frightened, they would have something they could reach back and touch, some sort of understanding of what exhaustion means to a soldier, what fear means to a soldier. I wanted them to know that sort of thing, and there's just no way to do it without putting them in that position. I think Saving Private Ryan was when Spielberg and Hanks kind of decided we need to give you a lot of, a lot of rain here, free rain, to take these actors as far as you can take them. And I think it became quite an integral part of the preparation for the whole film, really. So that gives you an idea of how intensive our training was meant to be, so that on screen, uh, you weren't just pointing a camera at an actor who was pretending to know how to use a weapon, you were pointing it at someone who was part of a, a manoeuvre that we, we understood the machinations of. Go runner, go! I want him on a 180, get him around the side as well. Okay, we have somebody in here on the left hand side. See who he is, he's in a black coat. Yeah, and and the, the series is still one of the most popular uh, series. It's so highly acclaimed. Why do you think that is? And why do you think it still captures the popular imagination to this day? What is it about Brand of Brothers? Yeah, that's a <clears throat> that's the $64,000 question. It's got to be a combination of things. I mean, the original, the stories themselves, obviously, of those men and the overall trajectory that they had through the war is pretty incredible. Um, and I know they weren't the only bunch of people who did that during the war, but they exemplify it quite well, I think. Um, and then I suppose the, the, the camaraderie that's portrayed in the book and then in the film because of the amount of research that was done and knitted together I think makes for a pretty compelling story. And then you have Steven Spielberg and Tom Hanks putting it into something uh, huge. It's huge. With the dig now nearing its conclusion, it was finally time to catch up with Richard to see what he and his team had discovered. Richard, uh, we were here on the first day uh, of this dig and within about half an hour we were already finding bullet cartridges, 
Now, when we heard about some of the objects that you were finding, we raced down here. Tell us about some of the stuff that you found. Well, Luke, to be honest, it's been extraordinary, so exciting. We start off with a structure, which is brilliant, but then it was, it was tantalizing. Each, each minute we'd get a new find, yep. it would become more and more exciting. They, they, you start off with something like this, and I like this because it's a very human thing. You think of soldiers in their downtime, in their bored moments in the hut. Oh, yeah. um, any, any ideas what you think well, that might be? I really couldn't tell you. Something for uh, some sort of instrument, uh, I'm not sure. No, no you're, you are right. That's part of a harmonica. Okay. So you can imagine yeah. the guys sitting in the barracks just whiling away the time playing playing mouth organ um just a nice nice human story i think yeah that. so we start off with that and then we seem to be upgrading all the time the paratroopers came uh from tokoa that's where they did their their jump school mm -hmm. and that's in georgia this oh. is another nice link now you see what it says there what does it say yep. good for one fair good for one so fair it's a token, of it's some a token sort. and if you flip it it's from a bus company this is the howard bus line yeah and that is based in Atlanta, Georgia. Georgia. And you think Tokoa, Georgia, Atlanta. is this from a soldier who's had a leave pass, yep. he's gone round and he's got a couple of tokens to go on the bus route and just come back with him. So that links you straight back to those, yeah. those training days before they do these final bits of training just before D-Day. You know it's them, you know yeah. it's them. Well, you know or it's next. them, it's, it's palpably American. And then if we're continuing on the theme of being demonstratively American, do you know that just, we talk about the uh -huh. Screaming Eagles. Yeah. That screams at the Americano at you, isn't it? That's incredible. You see that behind the president whenever they, they speak now. It's yeah. the, the coat of arms of the United States, Bags. the eagle. Um, yeah, really, it's really incredible. clear. Dress uniform worn, yep. worn up here. So this is an American button. So you can see how we're getting really excited. Now, why are we calling you all the time? It gets better and better. It can't get time. better than that, surely. What, what, what would, to you, would speak D-Day? What sorts of things that you think of on, on that day of days? Oh gosh, so many things. So many tell things. me, tell okay. me, Richard. <laughs> Let me show you this. Oh wow, go. that's going to be Hold from that. yeah. What do you think? think? Yeah, so that's going to be one of the uh, one of the clickers to signify yeah. whether it's an Allied soldier. It, it's a cricket. Yeah, uh, and a it's cricket, one of those things it. they click to each other for recognition. Wow. Um, issued on D-Day, so this is a D-Day artifact. Yeah. Um, I, I don't think they were used after D-Day by the paratroops. The 101st certainly have them, and it, it's in the longest day, it's in Band it's in of Brothers. It's in the longest day, famously. All these yep. things. Now it is, there you go, there's there a replica. Go, go on. So to show you. So if you were, you were in, in some bushes somewhere and you didn't know if it was, you could hear some rustling. You do, was it one click? One, one click, click, response of two clicks. Two clicks. So. an item that you know if you want you want to express d-day yeah that's something so Your i clicker. think we could you know we got that and i was happy we could go home didn't need to do any more we've got d-day yep. we've got the americans we've got the camp perfect and then you see someone doing a little dance by the metal detectors over the lines of fox come and you think that's that's probably a good sign yeah and they shout dog tag we got what have we got oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, <my. Is> that... <laughs> Now that's that, this is you know gold dust. You're not going to get that's these things. Gold. It's the rarest, gold. rare as hen's teeth. This. Right. Um, so you get the dog tag sign and in such remarkable condition. Well, that's you know well. I was I was suspicious. I thought this looks. Wow. It looks fake. Should we get it out? Come on, let's get yes. it out. Look at that. And it is Richard A. Blake. And, and his service his number. And then can you see number. it says T4344. So that's he's had a tetanus jab. Tetanus before, jab. Okay. Before. And then after that it says. A? A. This is blood type. Blood and type. underneath... C, that would be... He's a Catholic. Religion, yeah. So he's a Catholic. So wow. that um, is related to... And I, you know, I, I wonder how people existed before the internet, because within minutes, the team here has identified him... There he is. ...as Richard Blake. Uh, he's, he is a paratrooper. He's from the 506th Parachute Infantry Regiment, but he's from Able Company. Yeah. So he's part of that whole unit of paratroopers, Able Company, he's, he's, a, he's a technician, so he's what we regard as a corporal. Um, he goes in on D-Day, so he's in the first wave, jumps out of a Dakota, he's there before the landings, yep. so he's a, he's a jumper on D-Day. This, this item, you know, it links you to, to D-Day itself. He jumps in on D-Day, and then he comes back to, to Oldbourne, and then jumps again on Operation Market Garden, where he gets wounded in the hand, yep. and that for him is his war over. So he survives the war, he's 20 in this photograph. It's incredible. And he dies 10 years ago. Ten but with the wonders ago. of the internet, we're, we're hoping to trace his family and, and make these make these connections with people. And I love this that we connect America with a village in in Wiltshire and making all those stories. So again, you know, we, if we could have stopped at the clicker, we really could stop at this point. Yeah. 
until a second dance happens. Nice. And uh, <laughs> believe it or not, this, you know, we, we seem to be upgrading the story. This is another, another one. dog tag. I mean, one is almost impossible to, two is just incredible. So this is a much more German sounding name. Carl, yeah. Carl Fenstermacher. And wow. His number. And he's got his tetanus 42 to 43, so it's probably out of date. He's a Protestant. He's a Protestant. Protestant his yep. blood type is O. It's been bent. I yep. think also his middle name has been mistyped, so I think he may have even bent it and chucked it. Also, <laughs> it might be an out of date tag because it says 42 to 40, well, sorry, 42 to 43 for his, his tetanus. Well, so you maybe always wonder the why, they're, why you found them and perhaps. It could be that it's just an out of date one. We've got a new one. Yep. Now, Fenstermacher, however, is really gnarly. He is a member of Easy Company. So he is friends with some of the big names of Easy Company. Uh, we've got a picture of Forrest Guth um, outside oh, yeah. the hut we've excavated. Really good friends with Forrest Guth. There's a picture of him with Dick Winters, the biggest oh, name yes. of Easy Company. Of course. And this is him. And there he is there. Now very he, fresh face. How old fre was he in this? He's in his in early 20s again. Early he doesn't 20s. just do one jump on D-Day. He doesn't just do Market Garden. He does a third jump. Really unusual. Lou Nixon um, of Easy Company also does the three three jumps, three stars on his three parachute stars, jump. Yeah. So he does three jumps, jumps into Bastogne. So he survives all this and then upgrades, if you can possibly think of that from Easy Company, becomes a pathfinder. Wow. So he's one of the two pathfinders of Easy Company, marking out the routes that these paratroopers are going to go for. And he too survives the war. And you know, archaeology is about people. Yeah. It could be Romans, it can be Saxons, it could be about paratroopers. But when you've got an artifact in any of those time periods that links you to a person, you're touching history. And that's what, that's what I love about it. This is a, hold Definitely, it again, this is yeah. touching history. Even the rust you, on it, it's still... You're linking to a guy who took part in some of the most formative, amazing events in world history. He would have touched this. And he's he, member, might, he may have bent oh, it he himself. Have. Member of yeah. Easy Company. And he lived in this field in the 1940s. And wait. for me, that's a, it's a real hairs on the back of the neck moment because you're linking through to history through the items in the ground. And, you know, what a story. What a story. And it's weird when you think you're watching Band of Brothers, you're actually touching something from someone of... And he's mentioned in the book. He's mentioned in the book Band of Brothers as well. So, you know, this is one of the names. And, you know, I've been t we've been talk joking about this all week that we're hoping to add brothers to the Band of Brothers. And I think with yeah. these two men, we possibly have. A remarkable end to our week here in Oldbourne, but the story was not yet over. A few days later, Dan and archaeologist Giselle Kirali caught up with Andrew Fenstermacher, grandson of Carl, to reveal the news about the truly breathtaking find. We have a very special personal connection that we found to this remarkable man. We were all incredibly excited. I have to tell you, we found his dog tag with his name on it. Oh, wow. That's awesome. That, that's incredible. So also with this, Andrew, you can see that it says Carl F. Fenstermacher, which that's not actually his middle initial. So this actually gives a lot of information, but the fact that it's a bit, um, it, the information skewed, it's got the wrong middle initial and it's kind of misprinted and it's folded in half, means that it might actually have just been something he got a bit frustrated about since it wasn't the right, it wasn't really his dog tag, it was something misprinted and he folded it in half and just tucked it to the side. And then here comes us years later and a veteran um, or one of our team is metal detecting and ends up finding it. Yeah, that's, that's crazy. We know that his plane was shot down uh, on the way to D-Day. He never, never made it by plane, but um, he was actually transported then to the infantry. So he, he did make it, but wound up with the infantry instead of uh, by plane in the airborne. That's exactly right. That's what we've got. Um, so he did jump, sort of. The plane started to go down um, at D-Day and he ended up jumping into the channel. And um, he was recovered by the HMS Tarder, which is a boat out there, um, but he yelled out in German um, for safety reasons, uh, and they ended up holding him and his crew hostage until they could confirm their identities. He was an incredible guy. Um, he was friends with some of the key players as well. He was one of the key players in the 101st, but he was friends with a lot of influential guys himself. Um, did D-Day, he was part of the Pathfinders. Um, so they, those are the guys who went out first and put the Eureka signals out. And they're kind of, those were the, um, the guys who 
they volunteered for basically a life-threatening mission every single time, which is an incredible, humbling thing for us to learn. He jumped at Market Garden, so that was in, in September, middle of September in 1944, after D-Day. Um, it was very successful. For all the other paratroopers, not really a successful experience, but for the Pathfinders, it was a hugely successful. And then he was also one of only two planes of Pathfinders who jumped in for Battle of the Bulge for Bastogne for that critical resupply mission. So he was one of 20 men to, to make Bastogne um, resupply mission successful. Yeah, you guys have really uh, inspired me to dive back in and learn more about his story. This is something that, you know, he may have wore around his neck. He may, you know, he may have thrown away. He may have, he may have handled that. But is that, that's, is that a pretty cool connection with your, with your grandpa? Yeah. I mean, it's something that I'm excited to, to definitely share with my dad and my aunt and uncles. Uh, all of his kids are still alive. Um, and I know that, that several of them have taken a lot of interest in this and they'll be very excited to find find this out. Thanks for watching this video on the History Hit YouTube channel. You can subscribe right here to make sure you don't miss any of our great films that are coming out. Or if you are a true history fan, check out our special dedicated history channel, historyhit.tv. You're going to love it.